Amen. Okay. Well, glory, glory to God in the highest. It's about um, Jesus isn't sitting here in front of you the same way he is or he was when when the Bible was being recorded. Okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the ones who recorded it in the probably the perfect way. And the other ones, God bless them for all they did. I'm sure there's truth in there, but for some reason they didn't make the cut. But they saw Jesus, and they recorded him saying something really interesting. When the Pharisees come to him, and they said something like this. They said, why do we fast, but you guys don't fast? And he says, because I'm sitting right here. Basically, in, in layman's terms, I'm right here. Why fast? Why why dial up the God? Why why get on your face, weep in sackcloth and ashes, and break yourself spiritually. Bring your spirit low on purpose, which is what it takes to find God, the holy, the true God. Why do all through that when I'm right here? All you have to do is ask me a question. You don't have to fast to find me. You don't have to do that. You know, Jesus is invisible. But it's like Jesus is not visible now. He's gone. But to tell me the Spirit of Christ is not around today is is only because you aren't doing what it takes to get low. you got to bring your spirit low. You have to do what it takes to unlock heaven, and fasting is a big part of that. Fasting is one of the hardest things to do, but the path to heaven is hard. To find a real word from heaven is hard. To find a cheap word from heaven, all you got to do is go to your local nutcase church, and then you'll, you'll be good to go. You'll get a free, whatever they call a deposit. You'll get to uh, feel the aroma of God or whatever. But you'll never get dealt with. You'll never have to be humbled. You'll never have nothing. There'll be no sword. There'll be no cross. There'll be no nothing. Why fast when you don't have to? He says, when, I, when, when I'm gone, they'll fast. Whoever wants to talk to me will have to fast then. But I'm God and I'm not flesh. He was flesh then and now he's not. And so we as fleshly beings who want to get in touch with the, the supernatural, like I say, there's different ways of getting into the supernatural. Um, some people are able to tap into the supernatural so much that they can levitate things. You know, there's people who can get into the supernatural and all kinds of things can happen because they literally are making contact with the supernatural realm. This one is of the devil. So we got to watch out what kind of processes we go through to find the true and living God. Okay, it's recorded in the word of God. Genesis to Revelation, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. We know the real God is God. All these other things is spiritism, and it never deals with the carnality of mankind, which is so obvious. It's more like coping with the problems of our carnality. That's what the other spirits do. They cope with the uh, problems, but they don't cope with the root. They don't cope with the, with the heart issue. The heart issue is our heart is evil. And that needs to be a focus of ours when we're looking at a God that is pure. And that's how we come to Him. It's like it's like someone who has inherited like the family. Like Mephibosheth was such a good example because he inherited the situation because of his because um, of King David's love for for Jonathan. Jonathan has a son called Mephibosheth, and he was dropped when he was a baby, and so he was like a, he could he couldn't do anything. He was he was a handicapped guy, totally mangled up, totally messed up, and yet he found favor in the eyes of, of the king because he was the son of Jonathan, okay? And he was humble. He came to the king humble. He's like, what do you want to do with me? I'm a dirty dog. I'm a dead dog. And I'm like, and then that was like his attitude because he looked at the king and says, you're so great and I am so nothing. Okay? And that's the truth. He was a nobody. And the king was a somebody. But he inherited it, okay? And people can inherit favor with a God that we are so not worthy to be in fellowship with when we come and call ourselves not good and call him so good. We are criminals that deserve insane, high treasonous justice against us, and he is so worthy of all the honor and the glory. So our attitude before God must be that. That's how we come into the Spirit when it comes to the things of God. We come low on purpose. That's why people kneel down, they close their eyes, they fold their hands, they bow their heads, and they pray. It's all physical signs of humility. And then your heart does the same thing. And then you even change your lifestyle sometimes in order to come into the presence of God. You change your ways. You say, look, these are things I'm doing that is obviously not right. I'm going to restrain myself from doing evil. In fact, I'm going to burn bridges to those things that would even tempt me to go there. That's called humbling yourself.
yourself in the sight of the Lord, and then all of a sudden He lifts you up, and He becomes your strength. And so can people are able to remove themselves from just about everything under the sun. Well, you can't do anything as a Christian. Well, you, it's not that you can't do it. Why would you want to? If you start wanting that stuff again, it's just because you're losing your, your strength in the Lord. <clears throat> Why fast when the bridegroom is here? When the bridegroom ascendeth at the powerful and mighty ascension of Christ, and they worshipped him as God, hallelujah, why fast when I'm right here? You fast and break yourself and lower yourself, and that's how you get to me in the spiritual. But while I'm here in the physical, because Jesus was on earth for 33 years, and at that time you could actually touch him. The wise men knew it, the, 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 the shepherds knew it by night, they, they knew, they seen the Lord as a very small infant. And if you read some of these uh, old other books other, other than the Bible, um, there is history in there and I believe a lot of it's true. I don't believe it's scripture and I don't believe it's going to pertain to the essentials of the foundations of Christianity, but I do think that there's some interesting things in there where Christ as a baby, there's called the infancy books. There's a couple books of Adam and Eve that goes on for quite a long time. There's a book of Enoch, and there's a book of infancy books, which shows what was going on with Mary and her baby Jesus as, they, as he was growing up as a child. And there was a recorded incidents where Christ was casting out demons as a baby. Demons were being removed because he was there. He was still the powerful son of God, even not always people knowing it. They didn't, re they didn't always realize it, but the power of the God was still able to do things through him, even as an infant. Now, like I said, that's infancy books. If you don't like that, just erase that from your memory. Who cares? It's not something you need to worry about anyway. It doesn't matter whether he did or he didn't, because it's not going to save you or make you any less saved but for thinking that. It's just I'm just making a point. That when Christ is in the flesh, things go differently because he's right there. <laughs> Any time in the history of Jesus on this earth, things were mighty different. <laughs> I like to say it two ways: mighty and different, because it's not it's not oft that that much power is that readily available right there. I mean, it's still readily available, but we're so used to looking with our eyes that seeing in the spirit is very difficult for us to do. And some people would do that even around him in the physical. And he marveled to say, wow, you sure do understand the spirit realm. You sure do understand the supernatural, uh, the, re the realities of the kingdom of God. A lot of people are Christians and they really don't understand the principles of the supernatural. It's very, it's not a very easy thing to understand, but if you obey the Word of God, just like a kid would understand it, you shouldn't ask an adult how to read the Bible. You should ask a little kid. Read it to him and ask him what he thinks. That's probably a better way of uh, learning the Bible than learning somebody who's overeducated and has learned from a bunch of liberal death pits. Liberal theologians will lead you to hell. If I didn't say that loud enough, I'll say it again. Liberal theologians will lead you to hell. They aren't even close, okay? So let me lay the smack down heavy and hard. The poor, the broken, the humble, the meek, the gentle, the kind, the loving, the sacrificial, the suffering, for Christ did die. Christ did suffer and die for the broken and the poor. The rich and the beautiful and the and the perfect. You better sure know what you're doing, dear friends. You better be strengthened by God and let it remain there. Okay, there's people who get strengthened by God and then they turn from God, just like Israel did. And Ezekiel prophesies about that. You you had me and then you left me for another lover. You prostituted yourself against me. But all these points are biblical points of looking at why fast when I'm right here but now he's not right here for 33 years, those 33 years are long over, amen over 2000, let's see, 2015 where are we? 2015 right now, that means we're 2015 years from the ascension of Christ as they worshipped him at the Mount of Olives as God hallelujah 2015 years later, that's what year it is. What's the month? Four months 
10 days, 2,015 years, Christ ascended from the grounds of Mount of Olives and they worshiped him as God. Hallelujah. Because he's worthy to be praised. The bridegroom was here, but he's gone, and the ascension says it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Mighty Christ ascension in the glory. And all have fallen short of the glory, not falling short of the belief. <clears throat> Amen. Hallelujah. Man, I'm mine, oh man. Hey, glory! Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Well, that's pretty much a good shot on that, so we'll get to that later. Fasting is a, a spiritual position we take in order for our flesh to die that the spirit may be real. It's just because it's got to be real to us. I mean, God is always real, but it's just not real in our own focus. God's always there, but we can't really see Him and encounter Him the way we like to. We lose sight of Him because we feed the flesh. We feed the flesh and it drowns out our, our humble openings of our own heart. Our heart must be hungry, so we have to starve it. So it becomes hungry, and then we have room for Christ. That's kind of a humble way of acting, and that's the way it works. In some religions, it's their God is their belly. Okay, and they, they'll feed themselves, make them fat and sick and gluttonous. And you don't have to be physically, I'm not talking about physically fat, because there's people who are like, you know, like I have, um, I got to watch my intake valve, and I'm not exactly the biggest person in the world. It's not about, it's not about volume, it's about a spirit of gluttony, meaning I'll just pile it all in in my mouth and not have any, any parameters with eating, okay? Anybody wants to know what I think about that? That could cost you your soul. People say it's not about it's not about diet. That's wrong. Okay, the Bible rebukes them, calling your God as your belly, and that was a matter of heaven and hell. God was extremely angry with them when they were eating the quail, from because they were just pigging out like a bunch of gluttons. And then there was other ones. I forgot the other one that it was talking about, um, where God hates that. That's why fasting is so attractive to God, because it brings yourself low. So when people are willing to come in the presence of someone bigger than them, they have to say, I'm sorry for not being good enough. I am not worthy. That's what they say, that, that oh, I'm not worthy. And that's real. That's reality. That's where that came from, because someone actually knew. Now they make a joke out of it, and so people are watching TVs and watching people worship God. I worship you, oh Lord, oh, we worship you, we humble ourselves before you, we're not worthy. That's right, you're not worthy, and He is worthy. So if you can come to that agreement, and then it's like, okay, good, now we can agree, because now you know you're not worthy. That's what God is saying. He doesn't say it like that, because it sounds kind of mean, but that's a supernatural reality. He's worthy, and you're not. You got to remember that so you'll ever stay strong in God. He's worthy and you're not. You'll never be worthy and he will always be worthy. And so every time you come to him, you come to him as if it's your first day coming to him in your first life. I'm not worthy, Lord, and you are. I'm not worthy, but you are. Lord, you were worthy before time even began. And I'll never be worthy even though I'm only a speck in the middle of time. I'm a speck in time, and you are the master and maker, and you spoke time into existence. You spoke time, matter, and, and space right into existence. Time, space, and matter all into existence, all in one shot. When in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and this earth was without form and void. And it was like the gospel that we have in America. It's there, but it's without form and without void. It's barely there. It has a form, but it doesn't have any power. And that power is what all the flesh, because of sin, has fallen from the glory of God, not just knowing that he's real, not just acknowledging that the Bible is true. That is good. Profession and faith in Christ is good, but the power of God is what we've descended from because of sin. And until we get back into the bridegroom's chamber, I tell you, we still are in sin. Go to church, be a good person. Believe the Bible, believe Jesus' deity, believe it's the ascension, believe the virgin birth, believe in the blood atonement, believe in prayer and fasting, believe in the triune Godhead, believe that He is the only God, believe that there's no creation on any other planet except this one. Believe, 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 believe. Ascent, make a mental ascension to all these glorious fundamental facts, and you're still not into the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit is someone who lives there. They renew their mind and they live in a mind of God. They live in a revival. They live in a supernatural of the kingdom of God. It's not just in word. It is in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not in enticing words, but a demonstration of the power of God. Hallelujah. Hey, glory. 
your glory. Why? Why aren't they fasting? I hope you understand by now why they didn't fast. There'll be no wisdom, there'll be no knowledge, and there'll be no tongues. When you see the Master and the Christ on the right hand of the Father in the beauty of His splendor, trust me, you're not going to be fasting. You're going to be gasping for air on your face with your crown at His feet. Hallelujah! Glory to God. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. No need to fast. Amen. No need to fast when he's there, but he's not here right now. He's gone to prepare a place for us, but he's left a connector called the Holy Ghost. He's left a connector called the Holy Ghost, the third person in the triune Godhead. Amen. The Spirit of God came upon King Saul. He got angry. You never know what's going to happen when the connector gets involved. The third person. I think we got to keep on track here and remember who is worthy and who is not. It's the only thing that's going to keep us saved. Amen.